Hello and welcome back everybody with the Living History series and the International Euphonium Summit. I'm your host Nicholas Hofter von Heide and with me with us today is our guest for his fourth in Living History series, David Worden, while he's looking up a really awesome picture to emphasize the growing pains in the time <laughs> when he, he and the band visited Alaska on the tour in 1977. So we're uh, I welcome back to the Living History series, and thank you so much for taking the time to uh, do all this and to share your principles, your journey, your stories. Man, y'all, y'all missed out a really awesome uh, story about the Coast Guard band. And as we go into Veterans Day this weekend, uh, time of stamp. Uh, for this video would be November 9th, 2023. And we talked about Veterans Day parades, fireworks, the bicentennial uh, of 1976. Uh, might want to check that out if you're interested in learning um, what traffic can really impede uh, and uh, <laughs> take away from experiences. Well, I don't seem to have the poster on the place. I thought I might have it here. There's a, a private um, Facebook page for the Coast Guard Band for former members and current members. And I thought I would have put the photo up there, but I don't see it. I'll see if I can find that. It was a, a picture of our um, our publicity. But in the meantime, I, I had uh, punctuated the concept of growing pains on our previous conversation. And just to back up a little bit in history, um, the the Russia trip wasn't really so much a part of that because that was a very unique trip in and of itself. But the, the Coast Guard Band was originally the Coast Guard Academy Band. It was formed in 1925, and it did job basically for the Academy, parade reviews uh, for the cadets, things like that, and uh, graduation ceremonies, of course, and then some local concerts as well. But it was definitely a New London organization, New London, Connecticut. Well, in the 60s, I think in 1966, President Johnson signed the bill that made the Coast Guard Band a congressional band. So it was the, with a, a capital T, United States Coast Guard Band. That meant that we had now a national responsibility. It wasn't just New London, Connecticut anymore. It was for the nation. Well, they did, of course, pull us down to Washington a little more often, although the band had always gone for inaugurations. But um, now we did more ceremonies down there, but also concert tours and ceremonies throughout the nation. And that was great, except now I came in in 1970. So this was only four years into the, the new phase. At the time, though, it was run by headquarters. Our, our trips were run by headquarters. And headquarters had never done this kind of thing. I mean, Coast Guard headquarters is not really geared for publicity and concert tours and things like that, or even ceremonial tours. So that's not what they do. And we had a, the growing pains there. We're staying in some very uncomfortable barracks. Um, the standard joke in the band was we were 45 members at the time. And we'd show up at some military base or other 11 o'clock at night after a concert and go to check into the barracks. And the, the joke was we'd get to the attendant who was there at the time and he'd say, 45? I thought you said four or five. So they were typically not ready for us. Um, we'd check in, there'd be no pillows, no sheets, things like that. We we stayed in California in 73, our first really big trip um, in a barracks right next door to one that said condemned on it. And there was very little difference between the two buildings. Um, ours even, I don't think would have been legal. There was a, a fire hose, for example, that was in the central area, which was not hooked up. And in fact, it was stuffed into a locker somewhere. So you had to sort of know it was there. Good thing there was no fire in this old wooden barracks. So, and the, But the Coast Guard didn't have a travel budget really. Uh, so they could travel us on C-130, the Coast Guard's uh, search and rescue planes and cargo planes. So they got us back and forth that way, and that was uncomfortable travel. They, um, oh, I might have a good picture of that, actually, for those who have never experienced jump seats in an airplane. Um, it's quite the deal. They were, they were suited. Really, I mean, really, the Coast Guard used them for moving gear, mostly, and for flying um, in long endurance flights. When they're searching for somebody who's lost at sea or whatever, looking for a life raft out there or whatever they happen to be doing. And they had some aluminum poles they could put in 
and the poles had fabric seats that could be hung on them. Mm -hmm. The fabric was a nylon, solid nylon base, and then there was a web backing Mm -hmm. behind it. And it looked something like this when they were traveling together. Yep. Is that clear enough picture? It is. Not not real comfortable. Um, I won't show you the picture of someone using the bathroom, which was literally a hole in the wall um, in the back of the plane. (laughs) There was a little facility there for men. Um, our first long trip, though, in, involved a woman, and there was no facility for her on the plane. We had our first woman in the band. So she basically had to endure eight hours of flight before we landed for fuel in mid-America and then took off again. So uncomfortable that way. And from the standpoint of a performing musician, of course, I think I mentioned to you, Nicholas, in previous talks, that one of my favorite parts of being in the band was going on a concert tour and playing in different small towns, perhaps, every night different crowd, different auditorium or gymnasium or whatever. But meeting these new audiences every night was really exciting. You want to see people, you want to help them enjoy their life and help them enjoy your, your group uh, and install, instill some patriotism and, or encourage the patriotism or whatnot. Well, we had one of our big deal concerts, I believe this was still in the 70s, was in the famous uh, Damrosh Shell, part of Lincoln Center in New York City, named for Walter Damrosh. Beautiful concert shell, an outdoor um, oh, like a Hollywood Bowl type um, shell, but with um, it wasn't a big um, amphitheater. It was just a you know a flat plaza with seats. Well, in the best example yet I've seen of not knowing how to do publicity, the um, our headquarters would have called the local recruiter in New York City and said, "Coast Guard band's coming. They're going to play here. We need you to let people know about it." There was in the plaza a poster sitting on the ground in one of the planters, leaning against a tree. <laughs> it said Coast Guard Band concert at 7 p.m., whatever. And that was it. So we played for uh, perhaps a couple of passers-by and a few others. There was about a dozen people, I think, in the audience that night. Wow. And we, we had a few of those along the way. Those were just discouraging, you know, because you worked very hard to prepare. Mm-hmm. We played in a beautiful hall in, in Miami. What was it called? Uh, great, enormous auditorium where we had, again, maybe 18 people, I think. That was coming home from the Alaska trip, I believe. Um, so there were things like that that were all part of the growing pains of the band. Gradually, we overcame that. Um, our friends at the Air Force Band were very helpful. Um, a friend of mine and I from the band stopped in there and talked to some folks, and we came back with their tour book and presented it to our folks in the band. They have a, a loose leaf binder that's part of what they send out to uh, sponsors for the band. It tells how them it tells them how to do publicity and what the band needs and that kind of stuff. Great, great book and how to plan the, how to plan a tour. So we use that as a basis for pressuring Washington to, to first of all use newspapers as sponsors, which was at the time a great way to do it because they have all these pages they can put stuff on. It doesn't cost them money, and yet they can deduct it. You know, because it's a, a public service type announcement. Um, and newspapers at the time were were what people read every day. I mean, that was Mm -hmm. not so much today perhaps, but back then it was a big deal and things like that. And we also took out one of our musicians from the band and he volunteered for this, had him be our operations officer. So he did not travel with the band, didn't play with the band anymore, but he was working all the time on local and and, Mm -hmm. uh, national operations. Where are we gonna stay? Okay, we got this concert at this time. We're traveling to get there. Where are we going to eat? You know, those kind of things. Working all these little bits and pieces together. He, he was great at all, all the miscellany that, that went into that kind of stuff. And then we, more and more things came in-house, including some of the publicity that we were doing, things like that. And at that point then, things got much better. Um, we didn't stay at barracks anymore because we've had several experiences where it was so bad. We actually, in spite of the fact that the, the conductor was sort of new and very junior Mm -hmm. in the whole hierarchy of Coast Guard officership um, and not real confident of how much authority he actually had. There was some unclear chain of command things at the time as well. So, but we'd be in a barrack that was so awful, he decided, that's it. (laughs) Get on the bus, we're going to a hotel. And he just would send the bill to Washington when he got done. And they always paid it, of course. But So gradually we, we realized that that's not a dependable way to treat a band when these these uh, visiting barracks are used to getting four or five people at a time. You know, that's what they do. Or Or five. Yeah, exactly. Four or five or one. And um, 
It just wasn't what they do. And they didn't enjoy having us there any more than we enjoyed being there. As well, we learned that the Coast Guard planes became busier and busier as time went on. And budgets were shrinking back then in the Coast Guard in general. So they didn't have quite as many of anything that they might've wanted. And when you got a plane that's used for moving mission critical gear or for doing search and rescue operations, you might be reluctant to, you know, sideline it for a trip for the band someplace. So we started traveling more on commercial flights and things all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but gradually became more predictable and better. And we were able to get where we were going. <laughs> um, our first big concert, and I think I may have mentioned this previously in uh, another one of these sessions, but we got to go to Interlochen for the first time in the band's young life. That was probably 1979. But we, first we stopped the Oshkosh Air Show, which is a pretty cool air show if you've never been in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Um, a lot of uh, antique planes there and some more modern experimental planes and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Well, the C-130 crew was excited to take us there and then they were gonna take us the next day across the, the lake over to Interlaken. And they were gonna do a search and rescue demonstration. All this kind of stuff was part of the scheduled event at, at Oshkosh With and show the cool the things plane. about us. What's that? With y'all in the plane? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> we were st we stayed the night there. So we, um, we did a concert actually at the air show. Um, but they were going to fly over there and drop out the gear from the back of the plane, had this hatch in the back, and they could just drop things out. And also show some of the cool things, like the fact that it can back up on a runway, which is not particularly relevant to the mission, but it's one of the things a Hercules C-130 can do. Mm -hmm. Well, it broke down <laughs> once we got there. They couldn't do their air show. I've got a picture somewhere of the the crew sitting in lawn chairs on top of the wings, just watching some of the events at the air show that they couldn't participate in. And the National Guard, Air National Guard came to our rescue that time, and, or Navy, I guess it was, uh, flew us across, Naval Reserve, I think, flew us across the lake so we could make our concert. And that was, again, the, the trail end of the growing pains. More and more than the band became from within, a dependable organization. I mean, we, we knew where we were going to go. We knew how long the trip was going to be and what time we'd get there and things like that. And that usually was, was accurate. On the other hand, the audience knew we were going to be there that night and, um, and was actually going to come and hear us mm -hmm. more than just a dozen or so. Uh, we usually had packed halls and that was a good thing. So mm -hmm. then we felt like we were really doing our job. We were, first of all, as musicians, satisfying that scratch, that or scratching that itch, excuse me, but also doing what the Coast Guard wanted us to do, really, which is to get out there, get the Coast Guard's name out, since we were the junior service, and still are the junior service among the armed services. Not and not as well now. anymore. Got the well, <laughs> force now. That's true. Good point. Yes. Um, you guys graduated. There we go. So the, our band might be one up over the Space Force band if that becomes <laughs> one anyway. Um, anyway, so. But we got out there and we told people about the Coast Guard. In fact, our, our director wrote a, an original composition called The Story of the Coast Guard, which is actually pretty good. There's, there are recordings of it. There's one on my YouTube channel as well. You should listen to it. It's, it's a very interesting story. It goes through the entire history of the Coast Guard from 1790 hmm. to the present day at the time, talking about how the mission had changed and whatnot. It's all original music that he wrote, except for the snippets of Semper Paratus that come in now and then. And I believe for the recording I put online, the narrator was Alex Haley, the author of Roots. Wow. Was out. Yeah. That's cool. So that was, he, yes, it was. He was. It's nice to have his authoritative voice doing this thing too. And of course he's a history buff. So, he, you know, he was all into that. So that's something to look for. And um, we could play that at various concerts and let people know, gosh, at the time, I think our, Oh, the numbers, I haven't looked them up lately, but we were saving about 5,000 lives a year and, you know, millions or hundreds of millions in property and things like that, that most people, especially in the Midwest, as we're, you know, with not a lot of Coast Guard bases, right. wouldn't know that's part of our mission. So I think we were there fulfilling the mission for the Coast Guard pretty well. And now in, toward the end of my career, when it came up on the 50th anniversary of events in World War II, uh, again, we were out there playing World War II music that's... One of the things I'll upload is a solo I did during that time. I'll be seeing you, which was yeah, a very popular. Yeah, I, I listened to it this morning. Great job. Oh, you watched my channel, do I you? Did? Okay. Oh, of course. <laughs> okay, good. You're, you're part of that, the cohort. <laughs> there we go. That just showed up this morning. That's pretty, that, I'm talking about the video, right? With yes. Live video? Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. Yep. 
so that was over in pool england and um do you ever try it with baritone no not that one um it needed the the mellowness of the euphonium was nice for the melody parts mm -hmm. and i'm not sure it might have worked. I would have need more of a mic probably, but the baritone doesn't have a strong a voice really. Right. It doesn't have the large sound to help you get out in the audience. So and that never occurred to me anyway on that one. Um, Just curious. Yeah, I did use a baritone here and there, but never for a band solo. I used it with solos within the band. When we played Lincoln Chara Posey and things like that, I would use it for the, the actual baritone parts that were there. That's cool. But And, and the whole first suite as well, the original version of the whole first suite uh, had a baritone part that I would use that for. I've done on recitals, I'll, I'll use it to demonstrate what the euphonium family really is, the baritone, the euphonium and the double bell euphonium. That's mm -hmm. that's our group, our right. valved part of the family anyway. Anyway, but during the World War II thing, we'd also have a, we had a medley of um, the Glenn Miller type music, things like that, that um, our arranger was kind enough to actually include euphonium parts within it. Cool. Um, so we got, didn't have to just sit there and listen. Um, and that, so that was, that was a nice medley to play. And we had a couple other special songs as well that were written particularly for World War II events. So that was all part of the mission. And that was all, I mean, probably the music most of us liked anyway the most is one we would play for a, a musician's conference somewhere like the Midwest Conference or the CBDNA, the College Band Directors National Association, things like that, where you've got um, other musicians, band directors and such in the audience. Then we'd program slightly differently. We'd go more to some, we'd have some original music on there. And that's where I would get to play uh, the um, Jacob Fantasia, for example, mm -hmm. back in the old days anyway, when that was still sort of a legendary piece in the euphonium world, being the first major composer to write a piece for euphonium specifically. And things that you wouldn't necessarily program for a, a popcorn eating audience. Right. And I don't mean to, I'm not, not using that term derogatorily. I use that on myself too. <laughs> I want to eat the popcorn and enjoy the show, you know, kind of. Um, although much to my shame, uh, the band, I think it was 1984, uh, maybe it was the first time we played a concert in Davenport. And I'm not sure if it was at that concert or on a subsequent trip a little bit later where we played there as well. We were in their new um, Civic Center playing a concert there in the big room. And halfway through the, the first half, I think it was, somebody actually started the popcorn machine that was in the back corner, the commercial popcorn machine. Oh, to get stuff ready for intermission, you know? So the director actually stopped the, the concert and sent a message back that we, we really can't do that right now. So I guess it, I'm not sure if we took a longer intermission or what, so they could get the machine running and actually feed the people. But anyway, um, but it is part of the fun. And I, in most cases, we, we didn't like the popcorn machine, but in most cases, we understood in the casual audience setting, you'll have people roaming around, mm -hmm. you know, having a good time. Well, you've watched the anybody listening, um, if you're not in a military band, you've probably watched those annual July 4th things they broadcast from Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. right from the Capitol grounds, because they have a lot of famous people there and um, famous performers and um, her heroic his uh, history figures from the various armed services and whatnot. If you look out there, those people are just there to have a good time. And the same with the Boston Pops Esplanade concerts around that same time. They're just there having fun. You've got their kids there in strollers and they'll, they'll be waving little flags and things like that. Just dancing sometimes if the music is appropriate. Just having a good time. And we like that too. I mean, we the band did understand fun. <laughs> um, we even had some ourselves now and then. And um, so any, any concert like that was fine. Um, none of us enjoyed marching parades, I don't think. Um, or doing ceremonies, but as I, as I was in, probably after my first hitch, it took me a while to figure this out. That these events are really significant for the people for whom you're doing them. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to some little, I won't even mention the state, but a small town in a state not too far from where the band was located at the time in, in Connecticut. They're still there, um, one of the adjoining states. It was a firehouse dedication. It was a, like a, a volunteer firehouse for a community. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it was very important to them. Was that they'd spent a long time raising the money for it. It was a nice facility. It would make a difference in terms of how they could respond to things. And they were reading letters from all these people who wouldn't tell oh, the president sent this letter instead of attending, you know, you can't be here. And the senator and so on sent their regrets, but nice little letters. 
so obviously they, they took this very seriously. And so I realized, you know, when you play these things, those people are there with, with their hearts kind of already pounding pretty hard. Maybe not even for your music. We can help them enjoy it, though. We can help them celebrate what they've done. Provide that sound so, to their to their celebration. Exactly, yeah. Um, it is sometimes just the background music in some cases mm -hmm. to what they're doing. Uh, usually they'll get to play that. I mean, obviously the national anthem they're going to listen to, things like that. But um, but it, it's important to them. And, and the same with parades. Mm -hmm. Especially if there's a lot of people at the parade, you figure, oh, these people really like this stuff. Okay, so I, I don't like playing while I'm marching, but you know they're having a good time. So you do the best you can. So I have a question for you on that. Yes, sir. Uh, as we're wrapping this uh, segment up with military service bands and such like that, what's the Coast Guard? What was during your time? Maybe not so much now, but during your time when you served, did your band do a lot of change of commands or um, retirement ceremonies or a little yes. small elements? Of course, yeah. Because, <clears throat> well, you being a member of the Army Band, mm -hmm. you've got Army Bands in a lot of locations. Yep. Even in Washington, you've got the Army Band, you've got the Ceremonial Band, you've got the Heralding Trumpets, you've, you know, you've got all the different components. Um, and the Coast Guard didn't have those. We had 45 musicians. Um, from that, we formed a Dixieland Band, we made the Jazz Band. That came out of those 45 musicians. Mm-hmm. So we had, in one case, an oboe player playing sax, you know, things like that. And um, so, yeah, if there was going to be an important ceremony to somebody or change of command, obviously, it's pretty important. And whether it's for the academy or down in headquarters, um, yeah, we were there. If our schedule allowed, and our, that would usually preempt, usually proactively preempt um, anything that might be more musically elite, a concert somewhere or something like that. Um, obviously, that's part of the job, too. And uh, actually, I began to enjoy the, um, we, we still serve for the academy at the time, because they still do today, I think, for a lot of things. We play graduation every year, mm -hmm. and we'd also play the first parents day when the cadets have been there now for a couple of years, and the parents get to visit in the summer for the, the, the freshman class, we'll call them, right? And they're all lined up there. They've, they've learned sort of how to form in formation and sort of how to do the, the, the the uh, salute and the uh, port arms and uh, parade rests and the various things that are part of this ceremony. And the commandant would give this same speech every year. And, and when it got passed on the next commandant, I realized, okay, I guess this must be a pretty good speech. And it was, but we know it was coming. So it wasn't quite as effective after the first one, but you talk about, um, well, actually the part that I liked about it, um, this was just something they said, not as part of a canned speech, but a fact of life that all you are here are here because you were the top of your class. You were the best at what you did in your class. And the Coast Guard Academy is meritorious mm -hmm. only. A congressional recommendation is not gonna get you in if you don't have a good academic record and a good sports record would help as well. But the thing you know, right now you're at the, or you came in from the top of your class. Now you're one of a whole bunch of other people that are at the top of their class. So you may be at the bottom of this class, but you're still good, that kind of thing. But then, the, the story that got passed on, and I'm glad it did, uh, a concerned parent, a mother, wrote to the commandant um, of cadets, and who's an admiral, <clears throat> and said, you know, please watch out for Jimmy, well, I don't know what the name was, you know. Um, he's had kind of a sheltered life. You know, we worry about him being off now in the military, like this in a zone in the, in the Coast Guard Academy. And um, I just, you know, on and on about you know, and he's, he's really never been away from home except for the three years he spent in the Marine Corps. So um, that was a, a good laugh getter for the ceremony. They presented it better than I did just now, but um, but we could enjoy some of that stuff. And we got to do some, even some of the the more musical gigs were, could still be a pain in the neck. Um, you, you, do, you have to get up, well, I remember getting up at either two or 2.30 once and they're staying in New York in a hotel. So we get on the bus, get down to the ferry, get in line for the ferry to get across for a, either a seven or eight o'clock a.m. rehearsal for the Today Show that was doing part of this July 4th celebration. And because of the dignitaries were gonna be there, we had to go through secret service mm -hmm. clearance and all that kind of stuff to get there. So, but yeah, once we were there, we 
I got to see Lee Iacocca come by. He was a guy who just saved Chrysler and he was responsible for the Statue of Liberty restoration. That was his project, you know, he ran that. And we get to see occasionally presidents or vice presidents, not so much at these things directly, but oh, and we, we played with Andy Williams, for example, was a very famous singer at the time. Um, he was a top, top 40 artist to some extent when I was in uh, high school and college. And went on to play Vegas and do a lot of other things, had his own TV show and whatnot. He was, wow, this is great. Marilyn Horn, the opera singer. Uh, I think she was Metropolitan Opera, mm -hmm. was there. Uh, unfortunately, we messed her up, but she was there with us. <laughs> Did I tell you that story before? No. Oh, Go ahead. Oh. And if you want to share it, you can. Okay. Um, well, so I don't know by that time. This was probably late, no, probably early 80s or mid 80s. We played by that time in my career, I played the national anthem. I don't know how many times, certainly hundreds, probably thousands, you know. And we had to play it down a step, though, for Marilyn, because she went, her voice was more comfortable there. Okay, so that was not a big problem, you know, transposing down a step on something you know real well. You almost hear the intervals, you know, and whatnot. That, okay, that's not a problem. So we rehearsed it, it went fine. And the boss asked her if she wanted a uh, a note first. In this case, it'd be the E flat. It should be the first note she sings. Oh, say, you know. Said, no, I'll pick it up. We'll start together and I'll just pick it up right away. She had a pretty good um, pitch memory, I suppose, to do that. Okay, so that was fine. Perfectly in rehearsal. Well, we sat down for the rehearsal. Stood up for the, obviously, for the anthem in the, in the actual broadcast. But because of the, the um, staging and how they wanted us to look, we used you know what dance band fronts are? Mm -hmm. The little low music stands yeah. that are down about knee height, you know, and they they sort of slanted at about that angle so you can see them from your feet. We hadn't rehearsed with that. So we get the, that goes back to the snare drum. We hear the, the roll and then that's when we stand up. And all of a sudden we're now separated from the, the music, first of all, so we don't see it to remind us. And about half the band, our muscle memory took over. Right. And we sure played... Is. An F, an F, uh, well, it'd be a, a um, <laughs> music theory, an E flat triad, I guess, right? It did it. No, B flat triad, sorry. Oh, man, terrible. Anyway, played an F to start with. The first couple of notes were bad, anyway. We were about, we were one step apart. And Marilyn Horn sounded kind of iffy when she came in. <laughs> she didn't know who was going to win. Um, by the third or fourth note, it straightened out. I mean, we all woke up at that point, but it's, Habit is a great thing in many cases. It can help you through things, and uh -huh. you know if you if you that's why they rehearse in uh, oh, martial arts classes. They rehearse the moves because then your habits take over things like that. Musicians, we rehearse scales and arpeggios so we can have a habit of doing these things. Sometimes it gets in your way. <laughs> that was one of those. Wow. Anyway, <laughs> so I'm not sure if we count that as a ceremonial gig or a concert gig, really, because we were certainly there for a ceremonial purpose, but there was a lot of entertainment to go along with it. That, that would count as ceremonial. We, we've had those opportunities as well, especially when, you know, one of the retiring commanders or, you know, first sergeants or whatever would um, retire and they would want to actually sing with the brass band or with the Dixie band or with whatever element that happened to be with us at that point and definitely relatable with your your Dixieland experience with the 45 members and drawing out of that element a Dixie band or a or whatever element that is needed for whatever the needs require. Uh, yep. it's, it's truly amazing. I wanted to give a shout out because for those um, that aren't haven't listened to the podcast yet and wouldn't even see the shirt that uh, David shared with us uh, during the podcast segment. Would you like to share your shirt with? Certainly. And Certainly. this was, this was made front... by Mark Edwards Weaver, correct? Yes. Mark Edward Weaver. Yeah. Well, yeah. the front side of the shirt, first of all, is this is what the shirt was made for to celebrate the governor's Island facility. The Coast Guard had for about 30 years. Uh, in New York Harbor. So there was this t-shirt that existed. And when I was getting ready to retire, Mark Edwards, Mark, Mark Weaver, we didn't use his middle name much, uh, Mark Weaver, 
I'll see if I can fold it a little better here. Did the artwork on the back of the shirt for me. Let's see if I can look beside it well enough. There we go. It's got my name at the top, has me holding the horn, and then has the dates of service down here. 1970 to 1996. Yeah, that's not my lifespan. That's my dates of service. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I was very pleased to get it. And unfortunately, I don't wear T-shirts. But um, occasionally, I will put it on and or for things like this, maybe haul it out, show it off. You know, it'd be really cool if some one of our wa someone who's watching would take that same picture by chance, create a patch for your gig bag there for your instrument, ah, and there you go. Uh, seventy through ninety six or something like that to get you to or a sticker or something. Just an idea. That would be cool. I've got to look at my photos folder. I think at one point I actually tried to scan this. Um, that's I cool. think now nowadays with my my smartphone, you know, it'd be better if I can just get it to lay out flat, take a picture that way, and it would probably come out pretty well. But um, I, I like having those. I've got a caricature I used uh, occasionally online for temporary profile picture and whatnot that was done at the Midwest. And I was passing by, and a guy just did my caricature for me. And I had to show him a picture of the horn. It didn't have the horn at the time, but he did quite a good job. He did. And that, and another sketch that um, Fergus Ryan did, a, a Scottish artist, when he was visiting New York, New York City, and he was we were playing a little noontime concert, St. Patrick's Cathedral on the steps. He was there with a sketch pad, you know, and I just I walked over and said, "Oh, look at that!" I said, "Here, you want it?" He, he sketched me playing my instrument anyway. So. Oh wow, that's really cool. Do you still have? That was it? very fun. Yeah, I do. Absolutely, you bet. I'd love um, to see that. That'd be cool. You can probably find that on my photo album. It'll be the black and white sketch of me playing sort of from the side behind a little bit. And one of the few pictures I have that actually documents, I used the Stuart Euphonium stand for a while. Back before I found the, the great QHR lap pad that I use now and before I, um, oh, I, I tried a couple other things as well that were more portable. The Stuart stand didn't fit in all cases very well, for example, stuff like that, because it had big, heavy knobs on it. But it was a sturdy son of a gun. <laughs> anyway, I was using that at the time. So made by M.D. Stewart from Indiana University. He was a um, trombone and euphonium player, Philadelphia Orchestra. He was their, their euphonium go-to guy when they needed euphonium. So. That's really awesome. Well, to everybody who's watching, happy Veterans Day if you've served or know something, someone who has served, maybe a parent or a loved one. Uh, thank you for their service and thank you for your support for those that are watching and uh, make sure you show that appreciation, share that appreciation with those around you. It's a pretty important day for most of us. And uh, David, thank you so much for joining us for your fourth in series. Happy Veterans Day again. And to you. Thank you so much. And to everyone, until next time, uh, go find the podcast, all the links below, and especially at internationaleuphoniumsummit.com slash david-worden. You can find that link below and check out David's channel right here and uh, listen to some of his uh, charts that he uploaded, especially today um, from World War II era music. Um, until next time, everyone, thanks for joining. Talk to you next time.